Welcome to the Recruitment Hackers Podcast, a show about innovations, technology, and leaders in the recruitment industry. Brought to you by TalkPush, the leading recruitment automation platform. Hello, and welcome back to the Recruitment Hackers Podcast. Today, we are honored to have on the show, Mrs. Susan Hanold, PhD, who is also the VP in ADP's Strategic Advisory Services Group. Susan, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks, Max. Great to be here. Susan was named top woman in HR technology by Recruiting Daily and works with ADP's clients to build out their recruiting strategies. She'll tell us a little bit about ADP, and then we'll go into our usual round of questions about how this industry is changing. What maybe, Susan, to let you talk about ADP probably better than I can. We were talking before the show that ADP does a lot more than, than payroll and through acquisitions has moved into the RPO world and in the technology world. Can you give us a, a quick summary of your universe? Sure. So interesting to me about eight years ago when I was first hired at ADP, I came in as a talent strategy expert. So it was like you, I thought, oh, payroll. It's only payroll, but it's not. It's a full HCM, human capital management company, and it's been in business over 70 years. And, you know, over the last eight years, our talent ecosystem has grown. You know, we, eight years ago, we started with RPO business. We have talent management, talent activation. You know, you have to put different words on all the different type of talent products. So activation is kind of a new area. That's an engagement and performance area and talent management, and you've got talent acquisition. But you've you know, my attention with, with this uh, talent activation. I'll come back to it later. Yeah. And so, you know, to me, what's exciting is that, you know, it's a global organization. It's got 140 countries. And, you know, of course, we're known for payroll, and that's very core to us. And we have 58,000 employees. And for me, you know, like you, Max, as we were talking before, my day job was traveling a lot. You know, I lived on an airplane. And what was most important to me was, satisfying our clients and helping them build out their talent strategy. And so I was basically traveling around, trying to be in person, getting to know them and their businesses. And so that has switched a bit here now. Well, we have so many hours in the day now. I understand that you're investing some of this time that you got back from all that traveling around the world into helping your community and working with the University of Texas in Arlington. Yes. So I felt one of the ways to give back is to share those experiences and what I'm learning right now in my day job and the real life experiences. And I just feel like they are really enjoying that. They love hearing, you know, balancing the book work, if you will, with the real life application. Yeah. I could make a nice segue on the world of recruitments, hearing more about the stories than about the book and hearing more about the candidate than about the resume, which is something I believe you know, we must move away from in recruitment is move away from the resume. Well, tell us, how did you end up in talent acquisition, Professor? Well, it just happened naturally. I mean, I didn't, you know, say, oh, I'm going to go into talent acquisition. I am just a sponge for learning. And at ADP, I was given the you know, opportunity to really keep learning and, and building and learning more about what they offered from a talent product perspective in our sales and our services. And I started off in talent management and then it just naturally evolved to talent acquisition. And you know, the model that we follow is attracting, engaging and retaining. So many times I'll have clients that'll say, well, let's talk about our turnover and everything comes back to let's look at the whole ecosystem. So let's start from the beginning and come all the way through the talent life cycle. And so as I just started expanding my conversation and learning more, and um, so very thrilled to be uh, talking about it today. I've been asked uh, by a number of companies to look at retention and, you know, for me, it's the ultimate success metric for a company. You know, are you a people centric company? It should be measured by whether you can retain your, your people or not. And uh, the unfortunate thing is you cannot really give that number, the retention number, you cannot let any one department own it because it really starts even at sourcing. If you source a, a wide enough audience, a big enough talent pool, 
then you'll be able to be a lot more picky and find people who have a better culture fit, which should increase retention logically. So I think these arguments are a little hard for me to carry on the sales side to say that recruitment helps retention and sourcing helps retention. But, but I do believe it, you know, fundamentally in, in principle. Well, it's um, interesting because you, how did you know at the email I was just looking at before our conversation, because I had just got a request from a, a client that wants to have a turnover workshop. And yeah. that seems to come up quite frequently. And when I, you know, in my role, my goal is to help our clients. I'm external focused and, and help them with a lot of advice and insight. So I'm not really necessarily executing on a, a product, but it's looking at the whole people process and technology. And, and in my role, I'm product agnostic. So when the clients are coming and asking for help, like, hey, I've got a pain point of turnover. It's like exactly what you said. Uh, it's really, you have to dig in and look bigger picture and where is it gonna, where is it really coming from? And I, I'd say about two or three years ago, our team got together and we were hearing a pattern of turnover retention coming up. And we're like, well, we just need to start at the basics. What is it? What data do you need? And then we actually put a diagnostic together. And it sounds really fancy when you say, oh, I put a diagnostic together. But it I does. honestly started going to key stakeholders and businesses and saying, what data are you gathering? What are you measuring? And started pulling this together. And I hate to use the word HCM, but it truly is. It was a full human capital management list of questions. And I said, hey, here's a great list of questions that you as a recruiter or you as an HR leader can take to your CEO and say, if you say no to any of these questions, then you don't have a comprehensive turnover retention strategy. And so I just started kind of, and exactly what it said, it starts adding more and more questions to it. And it was wider. It was outside of recruiting. It went to performance. It went to communications. It went to marketing. And they all have an impact. So anyway, ended up with a good tool out of it. Yeah, the diagnostic, you can repurpose it. I sure can. I mean, with a PhD, you can call any worksheet into, worksheet into a methodology, <laughs> right? There's a way to commercialize that for sure. And I, I want to go back to that word you used earlier. Talent activation. Is that a new fancy word for onboarding? It, not really. Talent activation is really activating talent. So it's really engaging the talent, checking in, keeping the, their productivity up. It's a really connection to right now to resiliency that we're seeing with the pandemic. So yeah. as a leader, how are you able to react to adverse situations. So how you act, you activate yourself. And it's also how managers are working with team members or their individuals or subordinates They're to really engage them and keep them aligned to their goals. So that's a whole nother piece of it, which it does, you know, there's out acquisition, activation and, and management. And it's, you gotta love how we put all these words to things, these new names. I'll stay on, on onboarding for- <laughs> right. For me, uh, I've got enough words in, in my vocabulary, but thanks for that. Let's go back in time a little bit. And well, actually, on the topic of retention and the fact that it's in your inbox right now, makes me wonder, are companies preparing for 2021 thinking, well, we kept our staff in 2020 because everybody was holding onto their seats and holding on to dear life. And we'll have a wave of, you know, you have to be ready for a wave of turnover and churn in the coming months. You know, do you feel that going on in the market that there's a little bit of anticipation uh, and fear in that direction? Or is that just in my head? I, no, I don't think it's in your head. I think it's a, a very real situation. I mean, I think that there's, you have the companies that you've, you know, that are not sure when to bring staff back. So they don't want to have to furlough or lay off again. So you've had some of those companies that have had to go through those situations. And then I was just working with, you know, one of our newest RPO clients that is can't hire fast enough because they just can't find it. They're actually, you know, doing some of the COVID testing, but in sense, their sourcing is extremely high, but yet being able to keep and retain, you know, back to your turnover and your retention is, but you even mentioned onboarding. So how do you get all of that lined up so quickly? You scale up so quickly and keep and not want to lose somebody and still keep that whole candidate experience. 
mm. high because somewhere it's going to fall through the cracks. And you, so I think that piece is, but there, I definitely think that there is a sense of some folks that are very worried, right? So you have people that are wanting to keep their job, but yet I'm seeing some people, you know, go ahead and say, maybe business isn't where it's where I want it to be. And I'm okay mm. to jump. I'm going to be a job hopper right now, but mm. I still think there's some unpredictability to headcount needs where some businesses are fluctuating and that can cause a little bit of a roller coaster. And, you know, I even saw it with our own organization where some departments were busy. So people, you know, employees took a temporary job hop over to another department to, yeah. you know, leverage their skills. So it definitely is a little bit uncertain, but that cloud of fearfulness, I still think that's still there. Yeah, it's going to stay with us. Even post-election, I think uh, there's still a lot of uncertainty in the market. But, I mean, the recovery in Q3 has been very strong in, in North America anyway. And I guess then ADP should have a strong 2021 on the RPO business uh, and technology, of course. So you've got your finger on the pulse of the economy. Can you give us, uh, our listeners, <laughs> some insights on how the wind is blowing? Oh, well, you know, we do a lot of labor, economy, market calls yeah. and so forth. Of course, we're known for the unemployment report, but we also have something called the workplace vitality report, which, you know, is a quarterly real-time data or site, if you want to call it, that you can quarterly know what's happening with compensation, what's happening with the unemployment, is it a job hopper, job stayer market, what's the hourly rate and what's happening by part-time, full-time. And so by that, I'm definitely up to date on what's happening with the market, the trends, you know, really month to month, I look at this and how I can slice the data in different ways. But I, I think that's only one piece. I think the other piece that I look at to kind of know what's going on in the market is what am I hearing from our clients? And what kind of work are they asking for? And one of the biggest things that I, I'm seeing is just keep it simple. Mm -hmm. Like I sense a lot of people are trying to make it easier for the candidate, for their employees, and not trying to disrupt or, or come up with a lot of new stuff right now, new projects. But in doing this, they're trying to look at cost containment, process optimization, and really trying to say, how can I make my recruiting team as efficient as I can and still yeah. have that high impact candidate experience and get that quality candidate. And so a lot of times I honestly has been spending a lot of times right now in workshops, try, going through processes, looking at the current state, looking at the future state and saying like, what are some best practices some recommendations to make things better? What to in-house, what and to outsource. Trying to, trying to do that. And, you know, I mean, the balance of what do you keep in-house, what do you outsource in talent acquisition? I think that there's always going to be pressure on both sides to do for on both ends of the, of that spectrum. And you'll have some mild fluctuations that are driven by the economy. So in 2021, probably it'll be a little bit more outsourced than usual, simply because people are a little fearful of, of hiring in house, but there's never going to be a state of balance or a, a winner take all kind of Right. The situation. There, there'll right. always be that tension, right, between the two. Well, you know, and a lot of it, I think, is how open-minded you are and how educated you are to know just what your options are. I run, you know, if I was the CPO five years ago, the chief people or chief CHR officer, I may create my HR team very different than I would today. And knowing, you know, what are those outsourcing options and many times it's like, just give us a chance. Let us run a business case for you. Let me give you a couple menu options and then figure out where in your culture it's going to work best. Sometimes you just need to get somebody who's got the open mind to say, I'm willing to change my structure or change the, or it doesn't even have to be all, all or nothing. It can be a hybrid approach. One of the clients I'm working with now is they have a recruiting staff and they have some outsourced. And it, to me, it's just, you know, don't stress yourself out, right? Like you can go at this at baby steps too, right? Yeah, yeah. And in this model, and you know, thinking about this customer that you just mentioned, you're referring us to, is there a division of tasks or 
what, what's an ideal division of task for a mid-sized customer for you? And I'm, I'm curious because I see RPOs coming in for executive level hiring, for mm -hmm. volume hiring, for digital sourcing. And I suppose the area which remains in-house and that is most precious for the companies to retain is the onboarding experience where the closer you become to being an employee, the, the more that experience needs to be in-house and, and managed internally, I suppose. And that would mean like the front of the funnel is perhaps easier to outsource, but maybe that's just a wrong framework. Well, it's not the business I'm in anyway. Well, and if you just look at the market right now with unemployment, you know, of course, you know, recruiting teams are getting more sophisticated, right? But employees we're finding are having reluctance to change jobs. And so some may be leaving for 25 cents an hour or not so sure anymore that their jobs are going to exist. So, mm -hmm. you know, now when they're comparing their unemployment to, you know, maybe some security, that is causing a little bit of a challenge right now. So I feel like knowing your compensation, I get a lot of questions for folks that, you know, from accounts that are saying, I need, I don't have really good compensation, pay structure. I don't mm -hmm. have benchmarking data, I, you know, mm -hmm. help me figure this out. And a lot of times they'll just say, well, either two things are happening. One, they're truly off on wages, but they need to do the analysis piece. Or mm -hmm. secondly, it's an easy thing to say, well, it's wages, right? It's compensation. And I really need to look at our benefits or I need to really look and dig a root cause analysis. And so, you know, I find a lot of times where I'm helping them find how do I get good real-time data that's, you know, not survey data, right, from somebody else to know what your compensation should be, and then also helping them to dig deeper, just to ask them so thoughtful questions, because many times they're not even doing exit interviews, or they're not, they're just hearing it by hearsay, because they can't keep up, or they don't have a consistent process to get that feedback, so mm -hmm. it's just another way, on. that's another thing I'm hearing a little bit about. And when it comes to this compensation data, I suppose ADP is in a very unique place, right? Where you have more data than anybody else. Well, right. So you, and, and you, you can, I mean, there's, this data is, uh, is private, I'm sure. But if, it, if you don't put the name of a customer to it, you can analyze it, right? Right. And so we have two things that have been coming out. We have compensation benchmarking and then also pay equity. And, you know, what we're able to do is take the 30 million employees and 90,000 organizations and take that pay data and aggregate it, make it anonymized, and be able to have it filtered so we can get that data to be able to say, here's what the what's been to what your benchmarks are based on your industry, your size, and you know, be able to run that. That's been very helpful. And the second piece that's trending now for me is, you know, we had pay equity, we created that several years ago, but now because of what's happened within the market, is that the whole diversity equity inclusion topic. And now yeah. all of a sudden, that's been a whole nother elevated topic. And uh, this year, you mean, it's gotten even more attention than usual. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. And uh, where North America leads, the rest of the world follows for a lot of things uh, related to systems. I, I've read, and I could be wrong, but I've read that more than half of the world's enterprise software is purchased out of North America. And that includes most probably recruiting software. And, and so, doctor, I've heard a lot of companies complain about having to build systems which are very US centric, which ask all of this data, which you have to ask uh, for to be in, in compliance with uh, US equal opportunity law. And then it's creating sort of, you know, artificial barriers for candidates outside of the US where some of these questions are not required. Have you come across these kinds of queries yourself? And what is your recommendation for companies who want to be on one hand compliant in, the, in North America? You have asked a very difficult question. And if I could write a book and then get the answers to you, maybe I'll be a millionaire. But <laughs> I definitely think that being able to have technology that is simple to use, that can be used across a lot of boundaries is definitely key. And I also believe that you have to play to all the different compliance rules. You know, and one of the things I know that we've been looking at is just, this is very new, you know, it's very, 
hot in discussion right now is, you know, diversity dashboards and what information do you and can you even share, right? Mm -hmm. And then how do you include unconscious bias into this, you know, inclusion sentiment? And what do you do with self-identification? You know, all this is out of my expertise, but it's definitely playing into it. And the other piece is where do you have the human connection to? When do you have the human in this whole candidate experience? And when do you start to leverage your artificial intelligence, your texting, you know, all that experience with your ATS platform is, there's a lot happening there for sure. And these tools do help diversity because they expand the pool of people who can get in touch with you mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. you know, just make it easier for people to apply. And I think that ultimately uh, serves the, the purpose of uh, expanding the town pool and, and creating opportunity for people you wouldn't normally consider or that the hiring manager wouldn't consider. But I, I, you know, well, my two cents is that there is more demands uh, coming out of North America than any other market when it comes to capturing uh, this kind of data and protecting against, you know, let's say, setting up rules to protect the employer against liability. Right. Um, and, and it creates inefficiencies outside of North America. And so it may be, you know, with the internet global markets being large enough now for, for any company, including ADP, it may be time to consider having different implementations and different systems, one for global, one for North America, to optimize the, the candidate experience. My well, two you're cents, helping, I guess. You're helping that. me with the product roadmap here. But, you know, I do a lot of speaking and research around the remote workforce uh -huh. and the work from anywhere, the WFA. And since you mentioned kind of across borders, I, mean, I think that is also the bigger question. You talked about increasing your candidate pool and your talent pipeline. Well, you know, that whole diversity piece is definitely piece is part of it. But also right now is... I can't tell you the amount of conversations I've had with organizations who are, who are trying to do business cases right now to say, help me know from an ROI perspective, if I have a certain part of my population that stays remote or I phase them in longer, and I know you've probably heard this, you're smiling, I can see you now saying, I've heard this before, but just truly the trend of what it could do to getting your top talent. Because I mean, I just saw a posting the other day and and it said New York or something. And I'm like, well, do you have to be there in New York? Well, why do you put New York? If you don't really have to be in New York, why is the job description saying New York? So either, you know, clearly, clearly communicate that you're shifting or the job descriptions just can't keep up with it. Or, it's almost like the Y2K bug. Yeah, uh, exactly. You, you know, where they're like, we can't update the machine. About most ATSs and job boards and CRMs, they don't know how to list a job as remote. <laughs> I mean... I should know we just built that in ourselves just this year when we've been hiring remote for years, but it just doesn't compute. <laughs> so, but um, I really hope that in, in a positive light that this truly would allow people who are interested in positions and seriously, and for whatever reason, don't want to move or they feel like now that, you know, you've tested the times you're like, Hey, I've done this. Do I have the networks within the organization? Do I really need to be physical present in that city? And I, I hope that you at least have a conversation, right? A strategic conversation that somebody wouldn't eliminate me, but please still consider me. I hope that continues to broaden and happen and evolve. Talking about the work from home and compensation, two areas of expertise for you, mm -hmm. Susan. I don't know if you saw the news, but Reddit this week announced that they're going to eliminate cost of living pay compensation. And basically what this means is it doesn't matter if you live in, you know, in San Francisco or in Idaho, you're, you're going to get paid the same. You know, we're going to pay you based on performance only because everybody's working from home anyway. Are you seeing other employers follow that, that model where we'll pay you the same regardless and we're, we're going to stop, you know, pegging salaries on cost of living? I personally have not seen a big trend in that yet, but I definitely... I tell you, Max, you must know my calendar. I, I've been trying to talk to our compensation director because I'm, you know, trying to get a little bit of a handle on, we had essential employees, you know, paying hazard pay and all these different types of pay differences that we've been going through. And I think this is a great, compensation is going to get challenged. So I am all for 
rethinking our processes. Don't just assume everything's going to be the same. You know, I love how people say, you know, when we go back or, you know, whatever this new normal is, the new era that you reset and you rethink, you just don't go back. You actually can do things different. And I'm a proponent of that for sure. I'd like to ask you some practical tips on how employees and recruiters can stand out in today's market. We talked about the fact that people are holding still a little bit at this time, but clearly uh, the employment market has reheated and is, uh, companies are hiring again. And so there's going to be more offers coming on and a lot of choices. What do you think are the, the defining traits of a winning talent acquisition strategy as we're entering the end of 2020 coming into next year? So what are your recommendations for our audience? Well, you know, standing out in, in a competitive market is always important. And I always believe how people are treated during this time, they're going to remember. And if my manager cared for me, if our company did the right thing, they're going to remember. And I think that ties back to culture. And culture, I can see, is going to continue to be very important from a recruiting talent acquisition position. So I would really think about the bigger impact you can have with your recruiting strategy when it comes to culture. The second thing I would think about is, you know, there is a shift in evolving skill sets. So think about how you are investing in the development of your people. So normally we don't see those two necessarily too connected, but I think when it goes from organic growth, do I invest in you and, and provide you the training or source the talent? But a shift definitely in evolving skill sets. You know, ADP did some research and a few weeks ago they shared that one in five positions the way they are today will not exist. So one in five, it's like 22%. So if jobs are shifting that often, that they're not even gonna exist, the keeping up with the skill sets is definitely gonna be a challenge in how important development is. And the last one I'll leave you with is that the focus on branding, you know, around safety and employees first. So that is going to still be very critical in the upcoming months that to focus on building out that brand and uh, you know, the value proposition, what, you know, do the recruiters all have the same messaging and, and just what are you doing? If it's, is it through videos, however you're going to communicate that. And I've seen a lot of good companies that have been doing a great job of saying, you know, this is what the environment looks like. We're going to share it with you through video ahead of time. We're going to give you vignettes, whatever it is, but we're going to give you a snapshot of what it is um, for you. And that's how you're going to keep me either as a customer or even as an employee. So uh, those would be the few tips I would have. Okay. What do you think, Max? Well, I think I've got some work to do. I certainly <laughs> haven't uh, communicated enough on safety and health internally. I'm a bit of a maverick myself, and I have not been very precautious. <laughs> I hope um, I didn't offend too many people. I certainly think that, you know, personal health and safety is mostly a personal responsibility. But obviously, the world is changing uh, faster than I am. And I think you're right. So employers would be well advised to follow your, your tips on that one. And of course, to continue to invest in the employees invest in your culture, all strong themes. So, well, thank you very much, Dr. Hanold, for spending a little bit of time with us. I've and, enjoyed it. And I, how do people get in touch with you? Sure, they can connect with me on LinkedIn, Susan Hanold, or through Twitter, at Susan Hanold, and happy to be a resource to anybody if they've got any follow-up questions, Max. Fantastic. Well, I hope we reconnect sometime next year and under uh, a new world and uh, well have fun today i think today is election day so yep. i'll be watching the results at the american club here in hong kong a few hours from now it's going to be a long night <laughs> <laughs> entertaining to be sure yes well thank you so much max all right bye-bye that was dr susan hanold from adp and their strategic advisory group Lots to unpack in this interview, lots of great tips. Notably, how to adjust our messaging in 2020 and next year around the employee culture and how it takes care of safety and employee first. I hope you enjoyed it and that you'll come back for more. Subscribe to the Recruitment Hackers podcast and please share. Thank you.